خطط المرأة العربية الأمريكية خطوات كبيرة بالسنوات الأخيرة بمسيرتها نحو التميز بل الارتقاء إلى مكانة كانت حتى وقت قريب حكرا على الرجال برنامج هي دائما نسلط الضوء ونستعرض أبرز النساء اللي وصلوا وحققوا العديد من المجالات والهدف من هيدا الشو هو الدعم اكيد وتشجيع لكل النساء وايضا نعطي صوره مغيره غير الصوره النمطيه السلبيه المرتبطه بالعرب وين ما كانوا بالعالم ودائما بنقول الحياه حلوه بتحدياتها وصعوباتها والاحلى انه نتغلب على هالصعوبات وعلى هالتحديات مساء الخير لكل مشاهدي مسر خير لمشاهدي واتساب ميديا نتورك واكيد بنوجه تحيه للسبونسرز وبنتمنى سنه 2020 تكون سنه حلوه مليئه بالامل والتفاؤل والمحبه واكيد الانجازات الكبيره للجميع. ضيفتي اليوم هي المحاميه اللامعه جمانا كيروز. ويلكم تو هي. جمانا كيروز از اور سيلبرتي لوير ان بايونير ان هير فيلد. شي از اونر ان فاوندر of a highly respected and one of the largest personal injury law firm. She happens to be the only woman attorney to own a major personal uh, injury law firm in Michigan. Jumana K. Ruiz is one of the most recognized attorneys in Michigan who is empathy for the financial, physical, and psychological needs of accident victims is what built her successful career today. She was born and raised in Lebanon, attended the American University of Beirut, the AUB. Then at the age of 22, she uh, immigrated from Lebanon to complete her master's degree at TL in ethics, later receiving her doctorate in jury doctor degree in 1997. And also, she was just voted top lawyer of the year of 2019 and 2020. Also, which is an important one. She was just admitted to the bar of the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. And we will be back with Jumana Kairos. The One, we are business consultants who equip leaders to lead at their highest level while building teams that work together and support their team and the leadership. We deliver customized business solutions that fit your company's needs, including business development and customized process solutions. Contact us today. Thank you. Welcome to HIA. I'd like to welcome our celebrity lawyer, Jumana Kiruz. It's great to have you today. I am not a celebrity, but yes, yes you my are. <laughs> name is Jumana Kiruz. It is a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Hanan, for having me. You're welcome. You are uh, so present in the public eye. You are everywhere. You are everywhere, uh, from your billboards, from your advertisement, and your radio show. So, uh, I mean, being so, it, it's, it's hard to come across somebody that uh, doesn't know Jumana, <laughs> basically. So, uh, being so present definitely comes with pros and cons, and we're going to talk about that later. But at the meantime, you know, uh, people and uh, um, uh, businesses, they rely so much on social media for advertising but you are known for like heavy or you are a heavy billboard marketer. Tell us about that. 
Well, part of the reason is I'm very new to social media, Hanan. I am, uh, I'm just learning, I'm just beginning you know, to learn about social media. So for me, at my age, 55 years of age, social media is a, is a baby to me. Yeah. The idea of the billboards, that came out about, I don't know, 15, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I was inspired to put a, a billboard. And at the time, Hanan, I only had one billboard. And boy, did I think I had arrived. I really thought I had arrived. I had that <laughs> one billboard. And I was so proud of myself. And uh, obviously, the one billboard became two. And then at some point, about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I was very blessed uh, in business that I was able to take those five, six billboards and turn them into 50, 60, uh, up to some point, 70 billboards. And so how many billboards do you have now? <laughs> you know, I didn't count this last campaign, but I will tell you it's under 60. Uh, okay. <clears throat> because you have billboards, you have uh, the smaller ones, uh, I have some that are fixed, I have some that are rotating mm -hmm. to keep it a little bit fresh and mm -hmm. so forth. So, so tell us about the effect of those billboards on your business. The billboards had a huge effect on my business. Mm -hmm. uh, they branded me not just amongst the Middle Easterners, but amongst everybody here in Michigan and everybody visiting Michigan. So it seems, looking back, Hanan, that at the time that I was inspired, and I say inspired, mm -hmm. divinely inspired, mm -hmm. to have that idea, it was new. Uh, there were um, not too many lawyers who uh, you know, had thought of that idea. There were no female lawyers mm -hmm. who had thought of that idea. And uh, it, it really caught a lot of attention because I was a woman and because I was marketing very heavily. And you know, a, a number of people had told me at the time that it was very gutsy. It was very courageous for me to do was it. Was it gutsy at that time? I didn't. It did not feel as gutsy, no. But okay. interestingly enough, only men said that to me. Okay. That it was very gutsy to do it. And when I started to ask why gutsy, they'd say, you know, it's not easy putting your face out there and opening yourself up to be criticized. And you know. Uh, so how did you feel when they said that? Um, you know, I, I couldn't relate to what they were saying because to me it was not gutsy. It just, mm -hmm. it just made sense. It was the right thing to do. But yes, I understand something about being criticized. I mean, I've heard, you know, the rumors or read the rumors about my plastic, my many plastic surgeries. And, uh, you know, I think I don't go to work because I moved from one plastic surgery oh to another. Oh, my God. <laughs> and today... So, so the, first, the first, you know, yeah. two, three times I heard that, I was very offended. And now... And it's been for a long time now, you know, it doesn't. I mean, they but can. What do you say to them today? This is your chance to say something today. No, nothing but love. Okay. You know, people, people don't know, so people try to fill in gaps. Some people act out of fear, so they like to put people down. Mm -hmm. Some people out of ignorance. It's all okay. No biggie. No, no biggie. <laughs> no biggie. No biggie. I go about I living think it my comes, life. It comes with fame that you know, sometimes you might have a controversy or a rumor or anything like that Yeah. because you're famous, because you're pretty, because you're successful? Uh, possibly, I don't know, but I guess, you know, when you get exposed to something the mm -hmm. first time, it hurts. And then when it happens to you more than one time, you get going with your life. You know who you are, you okay. know what you stand for. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, as Mother Teresa says, it's between you and God. Yes. It was never between you and them anyways. That's yeah. what she says. Yes. It was never between you and them anyways. It's between you and God. So that's That's really a good answer. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, 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 that's the right answer for me. Okay. Right answer for me, yeah. So how did you go from being a lawyer that works for a law firm to a lawyer that runs a law firm? It didn't come in one day. There was no uh, plan. Mm -hmm. I did not Hanan, sit down and write down a plan and say, this is what I want. I think what I'm about to tell you, you will identify with. We Middle Easterners, mm -hmm. we Lebanese in particular, but not just Lebanese, Iraqis, Palestinians, Syrians, we're entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. We do not like working for others mm -hmm. so much. We like working for ourselves. So I think that spirit was present in me. And there were some life circumstances that w I was going through that kind of made it natural to make the transition mm -hmm. from working for a national law firm mm -hmm. 
to opening my law firm. Mm -hmm. Mind you, Hanan, my law firm consisted of a desk, a chair, a computer, a printer, a computer that was figuring out how to hook to the printer, writing down contracts, waiting for the first client mm -hmm. to call, and two chairs just across from me. That was my law firm. That was your so law it firm. was a huge leap of faith. It was courage. It was ignorance. It was naivete. It was a lot of faith. And I combined all of that. And looking back, I, the, the person today in me mm -hmm. who's more rational would say to the person who opened, started that law firm out of thin air, mm -hmm. what were you thinking? Mm -hmm. How did you know you were going to make it? How did you know you were going to get your first client and your second client? And you know what? It had to be a lot of naivete on my part. And I think you know how sometimes so as children we're naive and because of that we do things yeah. that the adult in us, and I'm sorry to interrupt, wouldn't want to do because mm -hmm. we use our brain, we, we use logic. Yeah. yeah, so I think there was maybe no fear at that time. There was less fear yes. because I didn't think about it so much. I, that's the problem is that sometimes in life when you stop and you think about it mm -hmm. and when mm -hmm. you think too much you become paralyzed. Yeah. Sometimes being naive like a child sometimes not thinking things very carefully actually helps you rather than deters you. And it helps you jump, I guess. That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Exactly what I'm saying. Because truth is, when I started my law firm, quote unquote, my law firm, there was no law firm. There was no client. There was, there was no advertising. There was just yeah. me putting one foot in front of the other and being in faith, you yeah. know, talking to God every day mm -hmm. and telling him it's just me and you. You have to tell me what to do today. And look at you now. You have a, a, you built a, an empire uh, around you. Uh, what are the, the challenges that uh, comes with running a law firm? Oh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't come any easier, huh? No. <laughs> Hanan, it is extremely, not to discourage anybody, okay. but it's extremely difficult to run a business mm. and it's extremely difficult to run a law firm mm. and a law firm is a business and it is a business where there is the money coming there are the expenses mm. it's a business that you have human resources it is a business that you are serving the public so it's extremely hard and you know I made tons of mistakes and I continue to make mistakes mm. less now because you know you have to make mistakes and the ones that are good they're good and the ones that don't they they, they help you make better decisions in the future. Well, obviously, you have to make mistakes in order for you to grow. Yes. yes. There, there is no other way. You can luck out sometime mm. and grow without you know, it hurting, but it's not as meaningful. So how do you, f how do you face the challenges of, of running a law firm? How do you face those challenges? It's much easier now than it used to be. Okay. If you ask me about my 20-year-old self, mm. a lot of faith. My mm. faith in God, you will hear me say this because it will not be my story, Hanan, if I don't today give credit where credit is given, where I had everything stacked against me. I mean, if I did not make it 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, nobody would say, oh, look at her. She didn't mm. make it. Mm. I mean, mm. I'm, I'm a foreigner. I'm an immigrant. English is not my language. I am in a male-dominated field. Um, I, I am a blonde. I mean, all these reasons, any one of these re reasons would have been enough for me not to make it. Yeah. And so how did I make it? My faith in God. I went back to my Holy Bible. Mm -hmm. And my Holy Bible said some amazing things about who I am. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure every Holy Bible out there, from the Quran to other Holy mm -hmm. Bibles, say magnificent and very empowering things about who the human person is. My holy book said I am divinely made. My holy book said I am fearfully and wonderfully mm. made. My holy book said um, with God all things are possible. Mm. And the, my holy book said so many things and I believe my holy book. So and if I believe mm. my holy book about what it says about me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, it's okay. You either take it seriously or you don't. Right. But I, I took you. it seriously mm. and I reminded myself it wasn't easy for me to remember that I am fearfully and wonderfully made because my holy Bible said that and I needed morning and night make affirmations about who I am and who I decided I am wasn't because of who my father he's on, here on earth is 
because of my Kairu's name, because of my you know, uh, savings, because of my fortune. No, because of my divine connection. Mm -hmm. That book said a whole bunch of things about me as the child of God, mm -hmm. and I decided, it said I am created in the image of God, so I decided to take it seriously. And I decided to repeat these things every chance I got throughout the day, mm -hmm. especially beginning with my morning affirmations and my e evening affirmations. And you know what happens after a while when you do this? You start believing it. Mm -hmm. And once you start believing it, your life would unfold along those lines. Wow. As simple as that. Yeah. And uh, as uh, difficult as that. And what you're doing is really reprogramming your mind mm. from b a victim mentality to a victor, so to speak, mentality. And the victim mentality, oh, I'm a single woman here in the United States. The United States is not my country. English is not my first language. Uh, I am in a, the legal field, heavily dominated. I can, I can use any of those. Mm. And I will mm. become a victim. Uh, but no. And the, you decided not to be a victim. No, I Ob decided that the holy books are to be believed, and I'm going to believe what yeah. they say about me as a human being. Obviously, uh, your faith gave you so much strength and power. Gave me and gives me. And give, it gives you every day. Every day and every second, morning and night, and every second in between which does not mean that I'm not a sinner, because I'm a sinner from head to toe. But obviously you, so have I, a, you are at peace. I, I seek peace, some mm -hmm. days more than others. Mm -hmm. Like all human beings, we have trials and tribulations, like you just started by saying that we learn from the challenges. And life, you know, it's not always. You're always, you just got rid of a problem, or you're in the middle of a problem, or you just solved a problem. Yeah. That's how it is in life. So we have little periods where we rejoice, things are good, I'm feeling good on top of the world. And then you have a little bit of a situation, and then you try to deal with the situation. That's how life is. That's how and, life is. And as it is said, it trains on the rich and the poor. And I mean, everybody, rich and poor, wealthiest person in the world, and poorest person, we all have issues and challenges. Don't think that those who in your eyes and in other people's eyes and in society's eyes have arrived don't have issues or challenges or problems to solve or things to overcome. Yes. Not at all. Absolutely. That's what it is. That's the human experience. Yes. That's yes. the human experience. <laughs> That's great. And uh, back to the law. <laughs> yes. Back to the law. <laughs> when I talk about the legal, uh, you know, you have a legal team. How do, do you manage a legal team? How do you keep them satisfied? How do you keep them <laughs> cooperative? <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm laughing because I don't know that I keep them satisfied, <laughs> but, but no, let's talk seriously for a minute. Yes. Here is, some days are better than others. Some relationships with some employees are better than others. Mm -hmm. Some employees are higher than it's not a good fit. So my law firm is no different than any other law mm. firm. But here is what my law firm stands for, as flawed as it is. Okay. We, we are a family and we treat people as a family and we treat our clients the way we would like to be treated. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, we don't look at a file as a dollar amount. Okay. We, we, flawed as we are, we try and it starts from the top. We try to treat every client like they are family. We try to treat every client like um, the way they would, uh, we would want to be treated is the way we treat them. Mm. And we also do not look at the law firm as a money-making machine. Do not get me wrong, you need money to live. You need money to support all these families who work for you. And you certainly need a lot of money to advertise. Right. But you cannot make the money be the primary goal. Because if you make money be the primary goal, you can become a very ugly person. Mm. But if you make serving others, adding value, the primary goal, then the money will come. So going back to your question, how do I keep my employees happy? I am sure some days better than others, mm. but when the intention, when we are all in the firm uh, seeking the same goal, which mm. is adding value and serving others, right. it makes things a lot easier mm. because it's something bigger than us and it's bigger than my pocket and it's bigger than their pocket. Yeah. And it gives a lot of meaning. 
mm. gives a lot of beauty to what we do. Because the practice of the law, like everything else, can become very mm. boring. Mm. It can become very boring. Yeah, but if your team is happy, you have a better service, you have a better productivity of course. Uh, in the law firm. Honestly. You have to appreciate them. Yes. You have to truly appreciate them. You have to scold them mm. sometimes. You have to set them straight sometimes. And right. as I'm often reminded by the CEO of the firm, it starts from the top. Because sometimes he does remind me that it starts from the top and that I should model to my employees what I want to see in them. Reminding me that occasionally I do not model to my employees what I ask of them. <laughs> so it starts from the top as well. Yes, yes. yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, I noticed often in, uh, in our community, uh, people make uh, career choices with a mentality like, I want to be a doctor to help people rather than I want to help people so I need to be a doctor order to become a doctor yeah. and how uh, how is it how was it like for you I mean did you uh, have like the desire to grow like for the legal uh, uh, system or the justice uh, after you finished or after you you started your uh, you know uh, career uh, you know as a as a lawyer actually growing up I have always been told you should become a lawyer mm -hmm. because you're apparently my um, you know, skills, my oral skills are apparently good. Mm -hmm. So um, I have been told many times growing up that you should become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. However, I was becoming a, uh, I was studying to become a doctor. So yeah. I was That's at AUB, yes, <laughs> yes I, was, I was a pre-med student. Okay. Long story short, when I emigrated from Lebanon to the United States to New Haven, Connecticut uh, in 1986, um, I went to Yale University, and mm. at the time, um, and I went to Southern Connecticut State University before and went state after, and they're all amazing universities. But at the time that I was at Yale, it was there was so much turmoil. The students at Yale University were um, striking because Yale University is the only Ivy League school that does not pay taxes to the city of New Haven, mm -hmm. and New Haven is so poor. Harvard paid taxes. New, uh, Yale did not pay taxes, so all the students were on strikes and my eyes were open like, what? You have that kind of power in this country? Mm -hmm. At the same time, speaking of the United States Supreme Court, you will not remember that, but one of uh, the Supreme Court justices, who is now a Supreme Court justice, uh, was getting confirmed to the United States Supreme Court by Congress mm. and a professor by the name of Anita Hill, yes. she accused him of sexual harassment. Mm. And there was this huge deba debate on the Yale campus about, you know, the Anita Hill, you know, allegations of, sexu of, of sexual, you know, harassment. So and did it open your eye? Uh, you so know? it opened my eyes to the power that an individual in this country, and I was mm. watching lawyers, mm. you know, uh, on the Hill, uh, you know, during the Anita Hill hearings, and mm. I was watching students, and as students will sit and will talk till 4 a.m. about whether Yale University should pay taxes, and so whether- So you were fascinated by that? I was more than fascinated. I did not know I had that power. I did not know coming where I came from, mm. a developing country, a developing democracy, I did not know yeah. that my opinion mattered this much and I did not know that I had this much power. Yes. Uh, I did not know that if I collaborate with other students, I can force a, an Ivy League prestigious university to pay taxes to the city it's, mm. it resides in. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did not know. So my eyes were open to how powerful laws are in the United States and how much power an individual can have. An individual can have power in every way, mm. but we're talking here using the law. And that became my, you know, my story or my uh, trajectory as a lawyer. So, so now, uh, so you knew at that time that this is it, this is when you wanted to be, you decided to to go to law school. Absolutely. Yeah. This is when I said, forget medicine. <laughs> I don't want medicine. I want to become a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want you to tell me or tell our viewers a powerful or a story about a powerful case that you experienced in your profession. One of them. Can I tell you another story? It's not about a powerful case, but it's a story that marked me as a woman. Well, 
Okay. So when I graduated from law school and I took my very first job at a uh, law firm mm -hmm. here in Southfield, Michigan. Yes. Being a baby lawyer, that was my second job. Actually, yes, that was my first job. Being a baby lawyer, they sent me to court to do something on a like a twenty thousand dollar settlement for somebody who died, mm -hmm. and out of the woodwork come fifteen kids who claim they are all kids of this person, mm -hmm. and they need to get a piece of that twenty some thousand dollar. Yeah. So I walked into court and. Um, the judge didn't recognize me, and it was a courtroom pact. Mm -hmm. And the, the judge, who is still a judge about to retire from Wayne County, he goes, who are you? Are you a lawyer? I said, yes, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. He goes, what's your P number? Oh. He didn't even believe I was a lawyer. Mm. And he says, what's your P number? You know, why your practice number. Why, why do you think Because so? I did not look like a lawyer. And I remember Because you're blonde and... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I didn't look like a lawyer to him, and I, he had not seen my face before. And maybe I didn't dress like everybody else. I really don't uh, know. All okay. I know is I felt so humiliated oh, as a woman. Yeah. Yeah. I was a baby lawyer. I needed all the encouragement I can get. Mm -hmm. It was very hard. And the courtroom was packed. And I felt humiliated. So you were in front of, I was extremely embarrassed mm -hmm. in front of the whole courtroom. It was Friday motion in Wayne County. And I remember looking at him and saying, you will remember my name one day. Yes. You and will remember my name one he day. He made a mark. Well, then you want to laugh. He's about to retire, and he gave me a call because he wants to see if there is a way he can work for me. Oh, how lovely so did is he, that? Uh, did you encounter him after well, of the course, incident? Because or? we have cases with him. Okay. And, you know, he is still, and he does not know that story. I mean, yes, he, he did what he did, but he does not know what it did yeah. to me and the impact mm. it had mm. on me. So that's, that's, that's one story I can tell you that really marked me. I looked at them and I said, you will remember my name one day. And another story where they sent me to court and they started using legal terms. Mm. There were about six or seven other lawyers standing next to me and were all looking at the judge in that same case over something. And the judge would say, would you object to a, a GAL being appointed? And mm. the first lawyer said no, the second lawyer said no, and she, she, he yes. used the name. And when they arrived to me, I said, Your Honor, I don't know what a GAL is. And everybody in the courtroom started snickering, oh. making fun of me. Because I did not know, in law school, we did not learn what GAL is. I knew what a guardian ad litem is, mm -hmm. but I don't know what a GAL is. Yeah. And it's one of my first times in court. And I am very shy, and I am very nervous, and I am trying to act like I belong. And there were all these lawyers and suits all around me, and they all started snickering. Aww. And I was proud of myself because I did not do my client wrong. Okay. I decided it's okay for me to embarrass myself, mm. but I will not do him wrong. Let yeah. me find out first what a GAL is, even if it is at the cost of embarrassing myself. So, you know. That gave you, uh, uh, I mean, that's a lot of courage, obviously, it, I mean, it, it, at that time. Absolutely, yeah. because you're young and you want, you need all the encouragement mm. in the world mm. and you are faking it till one day you hope you will make it. Yeah. And, you know, that's what life is. You're going to get rejections. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be told no. You're going to be minimized. You're going to be marginalized. Well, this is how you grow and this you get how strong you and that's it. This is how you grow in many ways, one of which is like I looked at judge and I said, I'll make sure you remember my name yes. one day, <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes. So maybe he gave me the inspiration for the billboard. Absolutely. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, yeah. you know, this show is all about empowering and inspiring women. What would you tell a woman or give an advice to a woman who is diving into a male-dominated field? Who cares? <laughs> Who cares? Okay. You know, the days are different. Am I saying that she is not going to? Yes, I had to work five times as hard as any man mm. to get to where a man got. And they're not going to make it easy for you. And in the beginning, they're going to make fun of you. And they're going to uh, belittle you. And they're not going to think highly of you. You don't care mm. because if you really want to get there, 
it may take a minute. Yeah. That's okay. You're working on your skills. You're working in the marketplace and so forth. But you will get there. So give no mind to the fact that it is a male-dominated field. And consider yourself extremely lucky. It's 2020. Yeah. Is it, do you think it's getting easier now for it women? It is getting easier. Is it easy? No. Is it, is it completely equal between the sexes? No. Not yet. Is it easier than in, in 2010? Is it easier than in 2000? Is it easier than in 1985? Absolutely. Yeah. Do not ever use that as an excuse or as a reason to hold yourself back. Yes. That's Absolutely. It. That's a good, uh, Who good cares? advice. Who cares? Yes. Who cares? And before we take a break, I'd like to mention that uh, uh, Jumana Kiru is uh, with volunteer or, uh, you know, some of your time to mentor one of our female viewers. With so pleasure. if you are interested in uh, learning a thing or two uh, from Jumana Kiru, uh, email us at hiamentor at gmail.com and we'll be. <music> The One, we are business consultants who equip leaders to lead at their highest level while building teams that work together and support their team and the leadership. We deliver customized business solutions that fit your company's needs, including business development and customized process solutions. Contact us today. Thank you. Welcome to Haya. Uh, as someone who has been a lawyer for many, many years. And I'm not that old. Well, not many if you years. Not I'm many, many years. and a half, about to be 56. <laughs> It is a rumor. It is not true. So how old I are you? I am 25 years younger than that. <laughs> That's what I thought. And my 32-year-old <laughs> daughter is adopted. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm 55 and a half. But I tell you, people you're I'm 35. 35. You're, you're and a half. Yeah. But you, you look a lot younger but than But I tell people I'm 35. <laughs> but wait, are we on? We are on camera. We are live. You oh, can't change any I statement right now. I thought we were on break. <laughs> wait. <laughs> so... As someone who has been a lawyer for a short time. 22 years. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you uh, know the ins and outs and you know how uh, to live and operate as a lawyer on a daily basis. What can you tell uh, aspiring lawyers that uh, they don't know what uh, they're up against? Well, I actually, I think my advice would start, Hanan, uh, in law school and even before mm. law school. If I had to do something different, here is what I would do different. Mm. Before law school, but if not during law school, I would be a fly on a wall of any law firm. I would volunteer at any, I would do it this way. I okay. did not do it this mm -hmm. way. I would go volunteer at a law firm and learn as much as I can. Because when you are in a law firm, it kind of demystifies and makes things a lot simpler yeah. because you have a much clearer idea of what law school is like and what it is to be a lawyer. So even before you start being a lawyer, you're already at, a, at an advantage over how to look at law school and approach law school because law school is very difficult. Mm. You can get lost in law school. You can get lost, they say, you know, getting lost the, the, the trees for the forest. And sometimes you get lost in the veins and the leaves so on the trees. it's normal to feel lost somehow. Uh, it, uh, uh, law school was extremely difficult for mm. me. Personally, it was extremely difficult. But then again, I was also a mother to two daughters, young daughters and so forth. But my advice, Hanan, to anyone listening, if you want to make it easier for you in law school, and if you want to make it easier for you once you are in the world after law school, volunteer, even if you do not get paid, who cares? at any law firm and learn. Yeah. 
-hmm. learn, watch. You can absorb a lot by osmosis, even if you're not doing, mm -hmm. by watching you will become a lot more comfortable, things will become a lot clearer for you. Some of the finest law school students were actually paralegals already and mm -hmm. legal secretaries and law firms. Okay. So that's my advice in law school. Mm -hmm. Now after law school, that will also help people a lot after law school. Yes. They will not be in the situation I found myself in when I went you know, uh, to court and so forth. Okay. And they will be psychologically completely different and much, much readier. However, my advice is do not go on your own. To those who want to go on their own, they have the right to do whatever they want. However, timing is very important. I really think they should work for a good-sized law firm for a number of years and learn before they decide to go on their own and, and run open, their own uh, and law firm. open their own law firm consisting of them consisting mm -hmm. of them and more lawyers don't rush that learn from other lawyers be under the tutelage yes. of other lawyers mm -hmm. and do it for a number of years and then you are ready and you have the skills needed to go on your own and be a good lawyer so that was my second question, but at the same time, what is your advice for, for somebody who is running a law firm right now? Like maybe a, an approach or something? Any advice that you, maybe on a bigger scale advice, something? I don't think I have advice for uh, p people running a law firm. I, mean, I will just say yeah. um, running a law firm is running a business. Mm. Uh, there is the business aspect of it. You have to stay afloat. That means that you have to make more money mm -hmm. than money you spend. The hardest part of running a law firm, believe it or not, to me, is not the clients. It is the employees. Oh, okay. Because you are in a large family with, you have 50 employees, you have 50 different personalities, mm -hmm. you have 50 different uh, ways of looking at things and mm. sometimes there isn't unity mm. and there is not a, the, a, the, the similar way of looking at things. Okay. So that to me is the hardest part of running a law firm, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. more than the clients. So what's the best thing about your profession? Oh, <laughs> um, you know, being so humbled and having people come and lay their problems at your feet and Although sometimes it's a car accident that brings them to you, mm -hmm. or it's filing for bankruptcy that brings them to you, mm -hmm. you will often find that a person is already broken before the bankruptcy, and mm -hmm. broken before the accident, mm -hmm. and broken before the divorce. You will see that there is a lot of pain, depression, hopelessness, um, uh, darkness in, in people and you're so honored that's why they call you when you graduate attorney and counselor at law because I've always said what do you mean counselor at law I don't have a degree in psychology what makes me a counselor at law mm. how arrogant and then I understood because when people come to you maybe they can't come to you because of a traffic ticket let's mm. say well we don't do traffic tickets but let's say traffic ticket but then they will sit down with you and you are in a position of trust, they open up. Next thing you know, you are advising them on other matters that have nothing to do with what brought them. So suddenly you become a counselor while you you're become, sitting with them. You become a counselor yeah, yeah. because y they come to you as mm. a problem solver. Yeah. And yeah. you can't say to them, well, I'll talk to you about your traffic ticket, but I will not talk to you about your marital problems. Yeah, yeah. you have to be sincere. You have to be sincere and you have to offer, uh, you have to help and offer solutions. Yes. Uh, that's, that for me is the most beautiful part of, it's very humbling. Yeah. It's very, very humbling and you have to. And I see up. like a joy uh, in your eyes talking about it. That is the joy. <laughs> yeah. That is the joy of what you do or helping someone in, with our immigration department, helping someone, you know, who has been fighting for years not knowing yeah. whether they'll stay in this country or whether they will be deported mm. to their home country. And mm. that day when you get them the result they're looking for, I mean, that's priceless. Mm, that is. Or in certain car accident settlements, not all, but some where, you know, the injuries are real and yes. they affected their life and you get them money and that money will help them. Again, that's not in every car accident, mm. will mm. help them, yes. you know, hire, 
quality of care to take care of their injured person. And it's through your help in getting them their rights, which unfortunately isn't the form of money compensation. Yeah. There is nothing as you else said, you it, can it do. Is price, as you said, it is priceless. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. What well, is the worst thing about being a lawyer? A lawyer is a lawyer 365 days, 24 seven. And there is no nine to five, there is no nine to nine. Um, it's very stressful being a lawyer. Mm -hmm. It's extremely stressful, extremely stressful. And if you happen to own a law firm, well, um, I have all these lawyers who work for me and they have all these files. Well, any problem on any of those files mm -hmm. is my problem. Yes. Any problem, any hitch on any of those files, mm -hmm. I hear about it and I have to problem solve it. Yeah. So for those who want less stressful lives, becoming a lawyer is not the way to go. Okay. Now, you can be a legal research attorney, mm -hmm. you can be an appellate attorney and do yes. a lot of writing, mm -hmm. that's different. But if you want to be a litigation lawyer, you want to be a lawyer who is you know, meeting with clients, and it's very, very stressful. It's not for everyone, but that is not to discourage anyone okay. either. Okay, yeah. well, clients and lion. Would you tell right away if a client is uh, lying to you or not? Yes. Of course, I am not God, so I am sure sometimes I'm wrong. Okay. Yes. But most likely, you know. Yes, I've become very you know. good at that. <laughs> I've, I've become very, very good at that. I'm sure sometimes I'm off, okay. but I think rarely. Okay. Oh, yes. Have you ever refused the cases that you believe all that? Yeah, all the time. All okay. the time. Can you tell us like a briefly, like a, oh. a little story? Well, here's one story today mm. from one of my associates who comes to me and says, Shumana, I have to talk to you about this ethical issue. What's going on, John? He goes, well, this client told me that there was someone in her car when she was in an accident, but she just testified that there was no one in her car. I took the extra step of calling that other person mm -hmm. who confirmed he was with her in the car. What to do? I said, John, what do you think we should do? Mm. He goes, I know. We should turn down her case because she is committing fraud okay. unless she mm -hmm. recants her story. Yes. So, oh, all the time, all the time. We refuse cases. Okay. And, you know, we don't, I don't want every, I don't want every car accident and every immigration case. I want the ones that are the best fit for me and for my you clients. You don't want just every, any case. Yes. Not only I don't want any case, but I'm not greedy mm. that I am beyond the blessed, but I believe that not every two people are a good fit. There mm. is a reason why you're married to one person and not all these other men, <laughs> right? <laughs> because the idea is a good fit. Yes. Same, same between a lawyer and a client. You want to make sure that it is a good enough fit. It mm. doesn't have to be perfect, but a good enough fit. Yes. Yes. Okay, now we're going to shift our talk to talk about the community. You know, Metro Detroit uh, area is one of the oldest and uh, largest, uh, holds one of the oldest and largest and most diverse Arab American uh, uh, communities in the United States. Yes. And we cannot deny the contributions of Arab Americans to American society. And I believe a big chunk or a big number of your clients are Arab uh, Americans. What are the difficulties that, that uh, Arab Americans face uh, when it comes uh, or encounter when it comes to, uh, to law? Uh, when it comes to law, they're pretty good. Uh, okay. In fact, sometimes they out clever the law. <laughs> sometimes they come and they teach me how to go around the law. Oh, they're okay. just that clever. Okay. <laughs> um, they're pretty good with the law. Somehow they have a way of knowing, you know, how to get their rights and how to go around. A to get the way out? Is that what And get saying? their way out or change the scenario a little bit. And there is another name for it. It's a little bit of fraud, you can call it. Okay. So I'm not worried about them with the law. Mm, I'm mm, not worried mm. about them with the law. But what I would say is advice of a different kind. I would say, and we see this a lot here in Dearborn, Dearborn Heights particularly, a lot of people who come and do not want to integrate into American society. Yes. And that's not a good idea. Mm. Um, it is very tempting and it can be very easy to live all your life in Dearborn and not have to meet too many Americans because it is, it is so complete You isolate here. yourself. I'm sorry. You isolate yourself from and the rest of the world, basically. And, and it's easy to do it in a place like Dearborn, Dearborn High, because everything is there. 
and everything is available in Arabic and you can go to your Arabic speaking doctor and your Arabic speaking pharmacist yeah. and your Arabic speaking school mm. and you can spend the rest of your life living amongst you, your people which is good but on the same time at the same time you know you are not integrating into American society so your English your is not good yeah yeah your English is not good and you're not integrated into American society so what you what's your advice to people who don't want to integrate into American society I have no advice for them if they don't want to integrate okay. but let's say somebody who just came from overseas six months ago and wants to seek advice first thing please go learn English mm. learn how to speak English learn how to pronounce English you will not be respected if your English is broken people will not tell you that yeah but I I will tell you and study after study has shown yes. that if your English is broken automatically you are perceived as less intelligent as than you mm. are secondly integrate into American society if you're coming and, you, and that's what you want mm. you have to integrate immediately how do you do that by you know going to American schools by taking an American job by joining organizations a little bit of everything mm. but you can't make your life all about your Arabic neighbors to your right and to the left and your cousins across the street it doesn't you work have to way. integrate mm. there is a price to pay if you do not integrate yes. you will not be able to advance an American society if you do not integrate yes so it's it's a it's a personal decision okay. and some people i allow people who are in their late 60s 70s 80s do not care to integrate mm -hmm. their life goals are different but someone young like you or even younger may have a different goal yes. well please learn english yeah. and learn it well master the language mm. you will not be respected if your english is not good well speaking of languages you speak uh, four languages. Three and a half. Three, what does that mean? Three and a half? <laughs> Three and a half. That's Arabic. What's and the half? <laughs> Italian. It used Italian, to be four, yeah, and now it's yeah. half. I've always wanted to learn uh, it's Italian. It's very easy. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. Uh -huh. it's, the reason why it was so easy to learn Italian is because I know French and English. Okay. Quanto tempo sta in Italia? Quanto is sta in French? Mm. Tempo is sta in French. Sta is stay in English. In Italy and Italy. So how long did you stay in Italy? Do you yeah. see how easy it is to say? It is. Quanto tempo sta if you, in Italia, you put if your you know, mind to it, <laughs> y you would learn it, I'm sure, yeah. But it is so easy if you already speak French yeah. and if you speak English, my point. I That's think. why I use that example. Those words are like French and English. Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love the Italian language. I, I it think it's so, so pretty. Musical. It is a musical. It makes you want to fall in love. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's about love. Yes, it's about love. And to romance. Me, it's much more beautiful <laughs> than French, by the way. Uh, the Italian. Yes. yes. I think French has elegance, the language, yeah. not the people. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story now. That's another story. The French language another interview. is very elegant. <laughs> However, the Italian language is so romantic. It is. It is. That is so Even beautiful. Even the music, the songs, oh, so yes. pretty. Um, you immigrated uh, from Lebanon at yes. the age of 22. In one week. In one, okay. Going on 14. Go, wow, okay. I came from a very conservative family. Okay, tell us a little bit. Grew up in the war. Uh, you tell us a little bit about, uh, about Lebanon a little bit before we continue. Lebanon today or Lebanon then? when you before you immigrated Lebanon then um, you know the war broke out when mm. I was 11 years old mm. and I came to the United States when I was 22 so I spent half of my life in the war mm. and I was literally hiding in bunkers underground mm. bunkers yes. um, we skipped school one year and so they made us jump a whole year mm. and somehow we managed mm. Lebanon I don't know. It was a beautiful time and a beautiful place despite the war. There were values, Hanan. Yes. There was fear of God. Uh, there was no, there was not as much materialism or anywhere near, anywhere near as much materialism as there is today. It was totally different back then. It was beautiful sure. because there was no social media. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was, that was my Lebanon. Mm. The Lebanon I go to, that's not my Lebanon. I love my country, don't get me wrong, mm. but I, I don't recognize, I don't recognize what, is, what it has become. Because you always reminisce about the old Lebanon. Because when you are, my generation is mm. a very difficult generation. Um, 
we are the last generation. I'm 55 years old. We're the last generation who still remembers the good Lebanon. Mm. But then people in their 40s, a little bit, the 50, early 50s, late 40s, a little bit, people who are younger than that, they don't know that Lebanon. Mm. So when you have a better model, how can you not yearn for it? Yes. So we are a, we're a very sad generation because we see what we see, but we remember what we remember so and how much more beautiful it was. Yes. So there is always that sadness in us. So what did you carry with you from Lebanon when you immigrated uh, at the age of 22? We always carry something with us when we leave our native country. Um, you know, of course. I mean, I think you can take me out of Lebanon, but you cannot take Lebanon out mm. of me. And I think that's for every, almost every Lebanese immigrant. I mean, I don't think you can say that of every French immigrant and every Japanese immigrant and every English immigrant. There is something about us Lebanese immigrants mm. where we love our country so much. We do. You would think we just left it six months mm. ago and we've emigrated 15 years ago and 25 years ago. Yes. And that's not by my saying, that's by mm. so many people saying. Mm. Something about that country, such a beautiful country, the values, the faith, the nature, the culture. Um, Obviously you have not taken your thoughts out of Lebanon and you kept your ties uh, by uh, helping charities and nonprofit organizations. And at the same time, uh, um, you host uh, politicians, influencers uh, at your home here in Michigan. So uh, how important uh, it is uh, to you, those ties, to keep those ties? It's not that it is important. It comes naturally, Hanan. It's a, it's a function of who I am. Mm. Uh, it's a function of all of us. Some of us can hold fundraisers, some of us can't. That's mm. fine. We, we express it another way. Some of mm. us go to our home mm. country more often than others. Some of us have built a home in our country. Uh, some others haven't. Some have done fundraisers, some haven't. But all of these are forms of showing you're tied to this country. Something, I can't explain it. One day I'll be able to put words on that feeling. But I am not unique in saying that each and every person who has emigrated from Lebanon talks about it like you just left it six months ago. That's how I feel. Right. Do you, you feel more Lebanese than American? I mean, I have to ask you this question. <laughs> this so is tempting. a very tricky question. <laughs> it's so and tempting. Very, <laughs> and my answer better be very politically correct. No, I am. <laughs> it should be politically correct. Say how you feel. How about that? I'm going to speak my heart. No. Um, as someone said, you know, Lebanon is my mother and France is my father or Lebanon is my mother and the United States is my father. Mm. No, Hanan, you cannot. I have, look, I left Lebanon at age 22 and I am almost 56. I have lived more here than I have lived in that country. I am, I am Lebanese and I am American and there is no one country I love more than another. It's like having two children. Yeah. It's like being the mother to two children. Can you say that can you honestly say you love one child more than another? Every time I leave Lebanon and I stay more than two weeks, I am very frustrated. I start wanting to pick up problems with people because of the, you know, the, the, the loss, lawlessness and whatever. And I and land on American home. soil. No, I am in Lebanon and I come back here. Mm. The minute I land in Metro Detroit airport and they say, welcome home, I feel I want to cry. Okay. Mm -hmm. I feel I want to cry when I hear the word welcome home. This is how much I love this country that made me who I am. Yes. By the same token, every time I leave here and I land in Lebanon and I smell, it's unclear what you smell once you land in Lebanon by the <laughs> airport. <laughs> Especially now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it's the smell of familiarity. It is the smell of my people. It is the smell of my childhood. Mm and something happens to me and I become very emotional. Believe me when I tell you, I so love this country and I so love Lebanon. And thank God, I am not in a position where I have to choose. That is why here in the United States, you cannot belong 
to a government of another country and keep your American citizenship. Yeah. Because again, if there is a, an act of war or if there is, if there are difficulties between the countries, they say to who is your loyalty. Mm. As a private citizen that does not hold public office, mm. either in the United States or in Lebanon, thankfully, I don't have to be in that position where I have to say, I have to have an allegiance. Yeah. So I can, I can look at these two countries. Mm. They've given me so much. Lebanon is my base. Lebanon is my ancestors. In the United States, United States look, I came here with $1,000. Everything I owe, I owe to this, this country. <laughs> I owe to him. First of all, to God. With the opportunities yes. given in this yes. country, where it doesn't really matter if you are a Kennedy or if you're not a mm, Kennedy, mm. If, you, if you come from money or not, if you work hard, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, you're gonna get there. I am, and I am such an example. That's called the American yeah. dream. From $1,000, I came with $1,000 in 1986. If this country didn't offer me the kind of setup that allows me to become, like many others, mm. the American dream, I would not be sitting here today with you. Yes. I wouldn't have caught your attention. You would have, but... <laughs> but not to interview <laughs> me. <But n> <laughs> well, we are blessed to have both worlds, I think. We are. <laughs> we really are. Yeah. I have, I have to ask all my uh, guests, you know, what quality do you have do to be in Arabic or L Lebanese uh, that contribute to your that contributes to your success. Well, I, the, I'll, I'll I'll give you one what I believe quality and one skill. Mm. The skill is I never knew that l knowing Arabic will come in so handy and help me make a career of myself. Mm -hmm. So I learned Arabic for 22 years because I lived in Lebanon, of course, mm -hmm. growing up in Lebanon. I did not know that my knowledge of the Arabic language as a lawyer catering to a very large Middle Eastern community will come in so handy. If you told me when I was 10 that that language is going to be essential in my success in a foreign country, 30 and 40 years later, I wouldn't have understood it. Yeah. That's a skill. Now, a value, and this is not unique to me, I like that we are emotional. I like that we're not only rational. Mm -hmm. Now, we are overly emotional. <laughs> but the beauty of being emotional in the right place at the right time is empathy is generosity, is feeling for others, is wanting to help. And as long as you keep it in check, because sometimes you have to use your brain too, that's a very good quality to yes. have that isn't always available you know, in other cultures. Yes, yes, that's great. And uh, I guess- Was that a good answer? It is a good answer. <laughs> I want to thank you so much oh, uh, for today, for thank this you interview. For inviting me. And this is my second time seeing you. Second or third? S second, uh, second time, yes. Second time. Yes, and uh, I really enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much for putting the time and to come here and uh, see us and uh, uh, to learn more about you and uh, you know to show our viewers who you really are and all that so thank you so much and thank you for doing this thank you for taking off your time and educate people in the hopes that something you will say or something they will hear will change their lives thank you for we having so. me we hope so and thank you uh, shukran lakil mushahidina liyum mushahidi whatsapp media and that's it for here